Hi there, everyone. This is your spoil warning that this part of the Yuzhina retrospective will be going to aspects of the Black Rose Saga in great detail. So if you have not watched the Black Rose Saga of Uzhina by this point, please support the official release, watch it on Nozomi's YouTube channel, watch it on Crunchyroll, watch it however you can, but come back here after you've watched it and please do not consider this a replacement for watching Uzhina as a whole. I'm going to explain about it later on, but... It makes a whole lot more sense if you watch Ushida before experiencing this video. Thank you so much for your time, and I hope you enjoy this. When Ushida first premiered in the spring 1997 lineup, its initial impact took the world of anime at the time by storm. Not dissimilar to the kind it would have gained as of current day some 26 years after its debut. In the single year of its run, it managed to win 1997's Best Television Award at the Animation Kirby Awards, a feat of which had only been won the previous year by Neon Genesis Evangelion, and would later be won by series such as Cowboy Bebop, The Melancholy of Haruhi Suzumiya, Code Geass, and Poliomagi Madoka Magica just to name a few. And while we haven't gotten around to it yet, Adolescence of Utena would get the Best Japanese Film Release Award at the Anime Expo Society for Promotion of Japanese Animation Awards in the year 2000, something of which would only come around to those who had high prestige in anime films even to now, such as The Girl Who Let Through Time in both 2008 and 2009, proving its staying power was more than just from its home country. In fact, its impact was so well done that, well, you know how I said that Takarazuka Review inspired the actual design choices of Utena in its initial planning process? Well, come the end of 1997, a Takarazuka Review styled com comedy musical of the first arc of Utena, Comedia Musicale Utena La Felicité Revolutionaire, ran for a few shows near the end of the anime's initial run in December of 1997. If anything, I feel like that alone would be a sign of it being one of those one-of-a-kind series because, seriously, name any other 90s anime that has had such an impact on the overall zeitgeist it had a musical or theater production happening before its show had ended. Hell, the entirety of the Takarazuka style of designs and overall flair had an overall resurgence post Utena, with Utena, the series, often being cited as the point where mediums such as anime took greater inspirations overall from that aesthetic, with more recent anime such as Review Starlight and Kageki Shoujo even directly lifting its overall premise from Takarazuka. Not only that, but stepping away from the influences in Japan, the influence its dub had cannot be understated as the majority of the voices from the Central Park media dub of the series ended up working together on dubs done by four kids as well, the big ones being the dubs of Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh! You can hear it very clearly in how Rachel Lillis' performance of Utena has shades of her roles as Misty and Jessie at points. Not only that, but you can hear Leah Appleburn's portrayal of as Kanto's grass gym leader Erika in her performance as Nanami, as well as Ted Lewis's performance as Misuru in his later role as Tracy Sketchit. Among other various voices the cast ended up doing in 4Kids Productions. It's arguable that without the RGU dub coming together as it did and being the big break as one would put it for the majority of these voice actors, that the voices we know today and some of the more infamous of anime dubs would never have been made. So that's yet another thing you can cite Ushina's impact and influence on. And that's not even getting started on the references to Ushina and not just anime post its release, but a lot of Western media in recent years as well, with shows such as My Little Pony Friendship is Magic, Steven Universe, She-Ra and the Princesses of Power, Pokemon at very differing points in time, The Owl House, and most recently, Gundam the Witch from Mercury, all have either referenced Utena in one way or another for either small little references or outright shot-for-shot -shot recreations of scenes from Utena itself. Or in Gundam Witch from Mercury's case, directly lifting the premise of the first episode and some processing bits every so often from Utena entirely. So to say that Utena's legacy as a standalone series as well as a hugely impactful franchise that has had its tendrils spread throughout not just anime media but also western media as well, it's clear from its accolades to its general appraisal from the years following on and to its continued influence on media to this day that Utena's impact is still felt even now.
So, where were we in the story again? Ah yes, we had just started the Black Rose Saga. The Black Rose Saga is often cited by many viewers of Utena as being the lull period of the series, with only 10 episodes of it being dedicated to it in total, and only 8 of them truly being dedicated to the overarching narrative of the stories at its core. In saying that, there's an argument to be made that you can skip the Black Rose Saga and not really miss out on much if you look at the Cliff Notes version of it online, or decipher what's happening in the events of the series to follow. But if you ask me, upon re-looking at the series, it's clear to be seen that there is more going on here than one may assume, despite its shorter time span in the series. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. How does this saga commence, anyway, is what you may be asking yourself at this point in time. Well, shall we continue on with our story and find out for ourselves? The first scenes of the Black Rose Saga involve us being introduced to three important fixtures. Nemuro Memorial Hall, a dilapidated building in Otori Academy where nobody has gone to for years, a white-haired man, and a lilac-haired twink looking over at the eponymous Black Roses that the, that the Ark is named after. Their comments on Toga's absence basically confirming their handover as the new series antagonist for this Ark, as well as answering how such a flower can bloom in a dark place such as the... Basin dungeon of the memorial hall by stating that the black roses absorb darkness from within their deaths. A very creepy thing, mind you, but something that works for this saga's themes of inner darkness. It's then, following on from that information, that we are also slapped right in the face with a very shocking revelation, which explains somewhat Amphi's sudden absence to Utena in the form of her having a big brother that she visits. This, in turn, introduces us to another majorly important character for not just this arc, but for the remainder of the series, Akio Otori, Amphi's big brother and the acting chairman of Otori Academy. While his role in this saga is very minimal for the most part, get used to seeing and hearing him a lot from now on as, until the end of this retrospective, he may as well be the third most important character next to Utena and Anthe. Not only that, however, but we're also introduced to his fiancée, Kanae Otori, the actual chairman's daughter and a, f and a fellow high schooler at Otori? Okay, okay, Jesus fucking Christ, almost had a heart attack there. The interaction between the four is a simple affair of introducing Akio to the audience, but also at the same time, it appears as though there's some tensions between Kanae and Anthony, as the two keep glaring at each other throughout the later stages of the talk. But it's with the teasing comment of nothing bad ever happens at Atori by Kanae that our main plot is kicked into gear, as our first black rose is plucked, and we're shown more of the white-haired man, Soji Mikage the man who's beginning to run the self-named Mikage Seminar, getting funding from those on the school board as well as even trying to enlist Mickey to be a part of it. While the actual seminar's nature is itself unknown by this point, the overall aesthetics that are shown to us as we see of the Nemero Hall later on in this very episode can give us an idea that nothing good happens here. Alongside its history of having a hundred boys from a Tori buried alive within it, it really gives off the creepy factor for sure. Not only that, but Mikage mentioning how his partner Mamiya would be the Rose Bride instead of Amphi, of which Mamiya corrects him to say Rose Groom, but we'll still be referring to it as Rose Bride because as Mikage puts it, Bride suits you much more. Yay! Regardless, alongside with comments made that End of the World recognizes their potential as being the true wielder of Dioris' power, it's clear to the audience that whatever plots are being hatched by these two with the Black Roses are ones to be used to replace Anthea's Rose Bride and steal the power of Dios away from Utena. And not even a minute later do we see Kanai enter the Nemuru Hall, fill out a piece of paper with her information, and bide her time to be waiting to be called. Next moment, we're shown to find her in what appears to be a claustrophobia juice and confession room, sitting on a chair as she mentions all of her issues with Anthe as the room descends down into the depths of Nemuru Hall, with every increment of her expressing her darkest desires of hate and disdain for Anthe causing the elevator to accelerate faster, until finally, they crash down to the bottom floor, where the hundred boys from Atori Academy are kept in coffins as Mikage leads her to believe that her feelings can be used to revolutionize the world, and by taking up a black rose crest, of which was previously earned by the duelist that had died, again, super creepy vibes here, 
and with her forceful corruption by the Black Rose stabbed into her by Mamiya, she can face the being plaguing her with darkness. And Fihemebia. It's then we are shown a challenge for Utena being shown in her locker at school, which means only one thing. Jury's back for revenge, finally! Oh, no, seriously here? It's Kanai waiting for them at the dueling arena. But the arena itself is marginally different compared to the student council duels, with 100 season tables being shown to represent the 100 boys showing up each time a duel in the saga is held. It differentiates every time for each battle with an item placed upon it to represent the person who is dueling to honor the Black Rose Crest. This one is basic, like Kanai, as it's mountain lilies, which represent the pleasure of life and a very stereotypical flower used when mourning someone or symbolizing their death in anime and Japanese culture. Obviously the symbolized the dead 100 students the rings are being used from. The pre-battle monologue from Kanai establishes the TLDR explanation of the power of the Black Rose, showing the quote-unquote real versions of those corrupted by the Rose, and by extension revealing their inner darkness within as powered by the darkness of the Rose itself. The duel itself with Kanai is... Again, like Kanaya herself, very basic and overall just really establishing the aspects of what we could expect for the Black Rose Duelist moving forward. With Utena hesitant to attack Kanai, having only just met her today, and not exactly wanting to harm someone close to Anfi. However, it's Anfi herself realizing the situation and advising Utena to actually attack her Rose in order to lift the spell which the Black Rose has placed upon her. With that being said though, the fight while basic is still a nice re-establishing of our status quo within in dueling, while implementing some hard changes into the mix with the new layout. But all of that can't really make up for the fact that the duel only lasts less than a minute. No kidding, I timed it. The duel only lasts 49 seconds between the ringing of each bell, making it the shortest duel we've not only seen just far, but arguably of the entire Utena series, period. And it's a shame because her ending of this part is just that she doesn't remember any of it as explained by Usa and Anthony's episode ending conversation. And aside from Mikage's stance on burning one of the coffins and muttering to himself about Utena's power, well, it's not exactly a disappointing start to the Black Rose Saga, it doesn't exactly start us off with a bang. What does end us off in this first episode is something we'll be coming accustomed to in the, in the following episodes of the saga. As Amphi returns to Akira's house, him posing in a very seductive way, and the two speaking a bit more than friendly to each other after not seeing each other for a week as the planetarium lights up the room and the shutters close. Get used to that visual, ladies and gentlemen and NBs, because that is going to end almost every episode in this saga. And it doesn't get any better on repeats. That being said, however, the opening to this arc does leave a lot to be desired compared to what we've experienced up until this point, as even when compared to the first episodes of the Student Council saga, there's a lot more set up here than what you would think by now. But in a way, it's probably one of the most important episodes as one of the aspects introduced in the opening act of this arc will become important to look back on, not just in this arc specifically, but with the rest of the bigger picture when it comes to talking about RGU as a whole as, like with Akio, this one arc has a lot of ramifications for the rest of the story as we know it. This is later expanded upon with the next episode in the saga, The Landscape Framed by Kozue, which finally gives us a focus back on Mickey's sister from the Student Council saga, and much like her appearance in that one being shown with promiscuously tinged vibes throughout it. This one has similar fe feelings from the first minute as we see a contrast between her and Mickey once again. And the contrast is seen very clearly as, while Kosawe is seen flirting with someone in the halls, she spots Mickey being given high praise for his skill in piano playing, noticeably more confident in his own playing than when he was when we last saw him doing so in episodes 4 and 5. A look of disdain coming across from her both in public and in private as she laments about the differences between the two of them. However, not all of it is based solely on the praise of those around them for piano playing and more of their shared differences when it comes to how Kozue views it with their levels of maturity in a way. As shown in this episode and later expanded upon in future instances as of the two showing up, as comments made in this one mention of Kozue having multiple boyfriends at once, and 
seemingly linking to the scene before, seemingly does this often enough that it's passive to her. Meanwhile, Mickey is still even after all this time trying to convince Envy to play piano with him again following along from losing the jewels last saga. Rather trying to convince himself to muster up the courage to even ring the doorbell to try and talk to her about it, having only gotten into their dorm through Utena bringing him in despite his reluctance into how sudden things have escalated. And while he does eventually manage to get Amphi asking that important question, it takes him a while to get that courage up to say it once he's in the room to do it. But to his credit, she does in fact end up joining him for the performance, showing a bit of growth in the relationship the two had e with each other, especially Mickey, mind you, since he dueled for her. But it's this moment when Kozue steps in while they play together, tied into a moment where it's implied that Kozue caused an accident with a music instructor who gave Mickey a bad time previously, does Kozue's motivation for becoming the Black Rose's next victim all but be confirmed. And with that motivation being brought about from her need to be all that Mickey thinks about, linking it in somewhat to her behavior being a symptom of this need to be cared for by him in such a way, does she reveal the rose that blooms at the end of the world and takes her sword out from him. Next thing we know, another letter challenging Utena is found and in a dueling arena covered in pictures that resemble a milkshake that Mickey had made for them both early in the episode. Kozue is found in the dueling arena as the next host for the Black Rose. Kozue, as expected of being his twin sister, fights eerily similar to Mickey's style from their fight, except in a more aggressive way of defensive stances against Utena compared to Mickey only pulling out one or two strikes against her. However, I want to focus on something here I feel I didn't focus on nearly as much in the duels in the past saga. The importance of each song that plays during the duels and the lyrics overall meaning towards the characters that Utena is dueling against. It was made in passing as to their themes when I looked over said duels, but that's kind of on a surface level only. It's when you take into account the lyrics of the songs playing as the duels occur, do you start to have more layers to peel back for each duelist and the overall arcs, not just in their respective duels, but arguably throughout the entire story of RGU. Take for example this song, Utopian Past Tense Incantation. Wow, I realize why I didn't start saying these titles, they're a bloody mouthful. Which works as a song about taking a time machine to the past and mentioning things that, while specific to Japanese children's childhoods, reflect the overall meaning of returning to a time of innocence that fits well with Kozue's rejection of that innocence compared to Mickey, despite her inner protests about wanting to be the closest thing to him, like they were as children. And that ideal does betray her, as Utena slices her rose cleanly, ending her role as a host for the Black Rose. Mickey awakens shortly after, and another body is disposed of not long after that. However, Kozue ends up having a bit more of a change of her behavior, even asking Mickey for that milkshake she denied before. I'll comfort you as I always do, little mouse. Squeak, squeak. What the actual fuck is going on with these two? Well, I do actually know, but this is a bit we're gonna have to cross at a later time. For now, however, with the back-to-back -back duels between Kanai and Kozue giving us the perfect backdrop to the Black Rose duels to be shown off, it's obvious that this saga is already coming across with a much darker tone than the already grim tone of Utena was previously. <sighs> So of course I have to break up the grim pacing of it with a writer's barely disguised fetish episode featuring Nanami. <sighs> okay, maybe I'm just being a bit pedantic about it, but to be honest, the Cowbell of Happiness, the episode that immediately follows on from the Kozaway Duel episode, is a non Nanami focused episode. Which means we are once again back to the completely divorced from canon storylines that feel way too out of place. And this episode may be the worst of it, in my opinion. The focal point of this Nanami plot involves the obsession over luxury fashion items, marketed by the label of Sebastian Dior, an obvious play on the real-life fashion brand Christian Dior for sure, and how she basically uses said luxury items to try and make herself more appealing to those around her. A superficial episode premise in of itself, but it gets interesting when she's upstaged by Jury wearing a one-of-a-kind necklace that she... got from modeling? I'm sorry, Jury. As in the Jury who fences, is a prefect at the school, and has a resentment over a lover that she can never have, is apparently also a model? 
A anyway, when she pulls out said pendant in an attempt to still try and be the one adored by everyone around her at the event, it's revealed that said pendant she actually purchased is actually... A uh, cowbell. Please tell me you're all getting what I mean when I say these plots being so far and away from what is going on, I feel like I am losing my sanity here! So she spends the rest of the episode's first act going all around the school and wearing it, ending up becoming addicted to people talking about her as she continues wearing it, blissfully unaware that people are slightly mocking her behind her back, including Ushida, who almost blurts out what the cowbell's actual purpose is before... Also, Nanami calls Ushida a slur, so she's kind of fucked in this episode, not gonna lie. This is then followed up by a dream in which Nanami is seen as a cow by Toga, leaning into the fact that he still hasn't awoken yet from his depression coma, is sold to be taken away to a slaughterhouse, and is... then made into a steak to be eaten by Dream Toga? Seriously, what the fuck is this episode? I want some goddamn answers! And then followed up by a montage of her daily behavior becoming more docile as she continues to wear the cowbell, a far cry from her br brutish behavior as previously mentioned, including a scene where she pulls a wheel alongside uh, with a... Uh, cow workout uniform, alongside a lot of her strange behavior changes. Y you know what, fuck it. It's not worth going into detail on. She becomes a cow. That's the big punchline this was all building up to the entire time. It was a Kaustian Dior bell instead of a Sebastian Dior bell, and Uzza has to break it off of a pitchfork. There, that's the episode. It's just another dumb Nanami episode and a long list of dumb Nanami episodes to come. I don't mean to come off as a bit annoyed by this episode, and I get I have a bit of a reputation by now of not enjoying episodes that are just dumb fun compared to everything else, but when I compare this episode to the Nanami episodes in the first third of this show compared to this one, this is what I mean when I say it gets more inane in its plots. I also really do not like the placement of this episode, as it takes place just as the Black Rose Saga is kicking into gear. This would be like if we got Curried High Trip immediately falling for whom the Rose smiles last time. It's a tonal whiplash that basically underlines a big problem with episodes focused on Nanami that are written by Yamaguchi. They really don't fit the narrative of what's going on, and even aside from their nonsensical aspects, they basically don't fit with these characters at all. Like the aforementioned sudden drop of Jury being a fashion model, apparently, there's a lot of odd bits of character in this that doesn't really work for in correlation to the rest of the series that we see at this point, especially compared to what we've literally just seen the last two episodes of this arc. To me, it comes across not just as a sign of the double-edged sword of what these episodes being written by a different person entirely from the main team can do in the worst way possible, but it also comes off as a team not knowing when to place these episodes in the order of viewing either. As if they had swapped the order of these episodes in this particular section for this one and the next one we're about to talk about, it might have made it a bit more fitting in the long term. But here, it kneecaps the Black Rose Saga early on in my honest opinion, which given it only has 10 episodes already to its awkward stature of being the follow-up to the Student Council Saga, but also basically means that we're over a quarter into this arc and it's comprised of the starting two episodes and a Nanami-focused plot which may as well be her worst outing not only so far, but of all her episodes. I mean, to the credit of On the Night of the Ball, it at least had merit to it by serving a narrative purpose for establishing Toga's goals early in the game, but also establishing to the audience that this does have typical shoujo aspects still. This, on the other hand, aside from its meme value in the later years of the fandom, and basically turning into the biggest running gag amongst the Ushida fandom as a whole, might be one of the most worthless episodes in the entire series because unlike her previous ones, they at least served a purpose of some kind if you watch them in a specific order. Here, there's nothing to save it from being the one that I wouldn't recommend watching on rewatches or just either skipping entirely to the following duel episode, or at least watching it after for a better total effect for the episode after it. <sighs> I promise I'm okay. I am zen. I'm not angry at you, Nanami. I know people consider you best girl. I'm just very, very disappointed given what we got from you previously. But on the note of that episode to follow it, however, I think it's about time we get reacquainted with a certain nameless character from last time. Yes, ladies, gentlemen, and NBs? She is back.
So, it's been a hot minute since we've seen Jury in gay agony, haven't we? Well, that's where this episode, The Four Ones of Death, comes in to give us some much-needed gangst on her part, as she is brought to the forefront, and we're finally able to give her a name, Shiori Takatsuki. Funnily enough, her debut in the series shows her returning after a bit of time away from Otori, introducing herself not just to the audience, but to Uta and Anfi, while her establishing a history between the two as being childhood friends who Shiori depended upon at, at one point, until the love triangle between the three of them began and caused the issue between them to balloon, in a sense. This sudden turn of events even distracts Jury to such a degree that she leaves a council meeting after having dealt with thoughts of it happening the entire time, later even being caught off guard by Shiori, who seemingly gives remorse over the situation to Jury in a weirdly backhanded approach, with Jury more or less having to spell it out to Shiori that she never had any feelings for him, but is still unwilling to disclose her love for Shiori even when pressed about it. This then leads to Juri to throw her signature pendant away, as a way for herself to strip some form of weakness from herself. However, this manages to backfire on Juri, as said pendant finds its way into Shiori's possession, and that moment spurting on Shiori through a search of discovery, landing her in the familiar elevator. It's then when we realize the truth of Shiori, that despite her acting previously and her apology to Shiori, she harbors a deep resentment for Juri due to her perfect socialite persona, and essentially tells the audience the only reason why she took him away from her was so that she could make Juri suffer, and with that discovery of the locket, despite seemingly having the high ground in their relationship, Shiori still feels like she needs more from Juri to suffer. And with the seal of the black rose on her finger, she rubs it into Juri's face and pulls out her sword from the friend she resents so much, and we prepare for the inevitable next duel to take place. Shiori's decks are adorned with birds, similar to the one seen earlier in the episode that flew into a glass pane door and got injured when Shiori initially tried to apologize. This analogy shouldn't be too hard to decipher based on that. Adding into that, the song that plays in this duel, Earth is a character gallery, more or less playing as both another analogy for their relationship as it is for Shiori's inner monologue and her feelings for Juri. It's clear Shiori's inner feelings are fueled by spite and jealousy over Juri and wanting to use whatever she can to have power over her in any way possible. The duel itself, however, once again shows the viciousness on the part of the Black Rose duelists in comparison to their student council counterparts, as this mirrors the duel with Juri and how Shiori keeps Utena on the defensive for most of their duel, Utena even commenting on the similarities in their fighting styles in this duel. However, much like the jury duel, it ends very suddenly, but with less of a miracle and more of Dio Sex Machina coming in to deliver the final blow. You're starting to notice how samey some of these duels are getting by now? Get used to it. The duels this time around, for the most part, are kind of like this. For better or for worse. For Juri and Shiori, however, it seems like their relationship is one of the big ones that seems like that, and while we may have more insight on the matters behind the both of them, that it still provides an equal amount of pain for them both behind the scenes, with Shiori knowing that she does in fact hold that lesser ground between the two of them, while Juri laments the fact that she still harbors a love that can never be. Both of them have a shared pain that stems from one another. Like light and day, yin and yang, their pain coexists with one another. And so long as Juri yearns for a love with Shiori that can never be, or Juri still longs for power over Juri in their relationship, their relationship will stay the same, despite the pain it will bring to one another. Do you see why this episode would have fit so much better following on from episode 15 now? Especially given the next episode, Mitsuru's Impatience is also another episode written by Yamaguchi. However, I'd argue that unlike his previous effort on Kalbo or even both episodes he presented in the Student Council Saga, it could be argued that this is his best work in the entire Utada series, as his contributions feel so well woven in with the Black Rose Saga and even directly follow along from what happens in Forms of Death. Hell, in my opinion, it's one of the only episodes that gives the character of Mitsuru an actual reason to exist as he's seen not just as Nanami's pet, but essentially as his own character, as a fellow student of his even calls out what he does for her basically as free labor. However, it does give us an insight that while he likes to think he's more mature, his words and general insight on things betray him. 
This episode, however, does have a few points against it, such as Mari basically having moments of pointing out some bits and bobs of sexually charged meanings to certain bits, like Mitsuru not realizing a banana is a sexual metaphor for fellatio. Hell, even in the following bits of the episode, we've talked about what Mitsuru needs to do to be an adult and find out what it means to be one, Uta blurts out that he needs to do adult things. Which leads into this sudden discovery. I think you and I have done some adult things together. Right, Miss Utena? Huh? Effie and Utena have fucked everyone! We have confirmation the two have fucked as of the Black Rose Saga! Which, to be honest, is so on point that it hurts to have to call it subtle. This obsession over needing experience with things such as making out and having sex, such things one would assume to be things that only adults do, reflects that continued idea that Mitsuru is basically still a child in that mindset if that's where his thoughts turn to, to the point that he's directly called out on such behavior by Mari. That kind of mentality, however, combined with the continued reflection of a mindset being spread out by those around him, and even somewhat infantilized by Nanami as a result of the confusion of wanting to be older to satisfy a need for his continued one-sided love for Nanami, leads him right into the doors of the Makage Seminar. Even his monologue in the Makage Seminar's elevator is less eloquent and more childish compared to those before him, as he basically just has no subtext and wants to wreck everything for those around him because of his feelings being unable to be accounted for in the long term. And with his feelings being called for, then denied by Nanami once more, her sword is pulled out for him, and yet another challenge awaits, one of which he believes will make him an adult. Quick rundown of the items here. Quick chocolate bars with a bite in them, similar to the ones that Mari took a bite of that Mitsuru refused to eat due to it being like kissing her, and later almost did in an act of weakness, reflecting the idea of wanting to be adult by any means. And the song that plays, Conic Absolute Egg Archibras, oh, unfortunately doesn't have many lyrics that correlate to Mitsuru's want to become an adult and feels like more of a spare that was left on the cutting room floor before being brought in at the last minute. And the duel itself. I'd argue it's probably better than the duel with Nanami, as he actually lasts longer than Nanami in battle by the end, and he even manages to get a few good hits on Utena as well before succumbing to Dio Sex Machina like each duelist before him. That being said though, the duel unfortunately doesn't make up much for character as, to be honest, this is probably the weakest Black Rose episode yet. Yes, even weaker than Kanaya's episode. But it's a close one in all honesty, given that Yamaguchi's writing doesn't exactly work well for our main plot episode. However, I do like to think that Mitsuru does seem to have a better way forward thanks to this episode's events. It's just unfortunate that after this episode he is barely utilized as much in a serious manner, if at all, because this one makes you think that he may have a character rock on the horizon, but as a word of advice, don't expect character development with Yamaguchi. Abandon all hope when you watch an episode written by him. It's for the best. Now might be a good time as any to take a bit of a break given what we've delved into so far, and especially before we hit the major story bits of this arc, since there's a bit more heavier stuff that we're going to get to in a moment. And while I am about to jump ahead a bit in the timeline a bit in order to talk about this, this is probably the most optimal time to talk about it because among all the pieces of Ushida media that we're going to discuss, this is arguably the hardest one to pinpoint where it fits the most as it has aspects from the main student council saga, as well as pertaining bits from the Black Rose saga as well. So let's get to talking about it then. Released on May 28th, 1998, nearly six months after the ending of the anime and about a year and a bit from the movie in 1999, Story of the Someday Revolution for Sega Saturn came out as a Japan exclusive. Much like most anime video games at the time, their main way of being released was either being released on Sony's PlayStation or Sega's Saturn console. And for some reason, only the most obscure ones seem to go for the Saturn as I have never seen a popular anime have a game released on there. But why talk about Story of the Someday Revolution at all? It's a game that probably doesn't even have any bearing on the overall narrative to begin with. And you'd be right, if not for the fact that Ikuhara himself oversaw the game's development, and the people who worked on the anime also worked on the story and art for the game as well. That, plus small bits in interviews in later years stating that many consider the events of the game semi-canon to the story that was present in the anime leads to a hotly debated topic on whether or not the Saturn game is canon or not. 
but I'll leave that up to you, the viewer, to decide as we stumble along through this. However, as it is a Sega Saturn game made only in Japan, that means I have only two options on how to approach this topic. Either A, I go ahead and buy a Sega Saturn console, pray it still works in 2023, buy a Pseudo Saturn Kai in order to either play a bird copy of the game in English, or to then buy and play the Japanese copy of the game, and then record footage for you all to see, or B, I can just emulate it. Shut up! Do you know how expensive Sega Saturns are these days? Now, getting into the game itself, it takes place during the events of the Student Council Saga, when you play as a recent transfer student into Otori Academy, whose garish purple hair gives me major early Deviantart OC or vibes to be honest. The plot essentially has you interact with the entire named cast of Usuna, alongside an original creation exclusively for this game in Chigusa, who informs your avatar that a tragedy may befall her on the fourth day of being at Otori Academy. As such, you have three days in the game in order to gain the favor of the cast of characters, as it basically becomes a dating sim at this point, with the ending that you get depending on how much time you spend with each character each of the characters and hit certain flags in order to get their specific character ending. With endings ranging from you falling for Utana, Anthe, any of the student council members, or helping take down Shigusa and transferring away from Motori, standard affair for what is effectively a glorified Utana dating sim with some nice exclusive visuals in there when you get the endings where Utana duels Shigusa. That being said, however, Story of the Sunday Revolution, despite it being a stock standard visual novel with some interesting visuals, does give us some insight into certain characters that the fandom at large has basically lauded this game for doing so after the fact, and even applaud it for even giving us these character interactions that otherwise wouldn't even be a thing in the series proper. You get a lot of interactions with characters that only show up in a few episodes to this point, like Kozue and Shiori, and while the status on if their characterizations within this version of Utena are exactly one-to-one canon-wise when it comes to what we've seen or will see, to say that these don't make for good bits of discussion when talking about them is a bit of a mischance in my opinion. Regardless, however, Story of the Someday Revolution does hold a lot of merit for being an anime game on the Sega Saturn that manages to remain an engaging piece of media all throughout, while reminding itself that it is in fact still a GAME at the end of it. Something I wish the likes of the desk code blank of three years could have seriously taken notes from! However, I wouldn't consider it essential to understanding the plot and story beats of Utena as a whole, as like many, I consider this more of a side dish to Utena's main course than an overall missing piece to the puzzle, that is, the Utena mythos. But if you enjoy a good dating sim and want to be able to romance the likes of your favorite Utena cast members your own way while also getting a unique experience throughout, I'd recommend it to you. Also, what other piece of media in any franchise has a game opening where the original voice actors all sing a lyrical version of one of the BTMs from the series, and also have a unique version of them all saying the Sega chime every time you boot the game up? Sega! 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 None. None that I know of can do this. Plus, it makes for a good detour of sorts before we get to the next parts of the story, which effectively makes us near the halfway point of our journey in total, and kind of begins to show us what we've been experienced up until now, might just be one of the more nicer parts of the series. And what follows next might be its darker twin. As I hinted at just before, the following episodes of this part are probably not just the first hints of the darker nature of Rusina's second half, but also act as the stage of the Black Rose Saga that, to me anyways, basically justifies its existence, as it involves a two-parter that follows up on one of the earliest story beats introduced, Wakaba's feelings of unrequited love. This two-parter, starting on the episode A Song for a Kingdom Now Lost, may at first seem a bit of an out-of-the-blue one focusing primarily on Wakaba as a character focus instead of any of the other characters, is actually a very interesting change given how this series has played out up until this point. Even the opening, with the curtains normally used for the introduction of the prince story for Usha's background, now being used for Wakaba's dream of being with her own prince painting a picture of something much different underneath the surface of this saga. It also seems a bit more odd when a new character, Tatsuya Kazabi, is introduced so soon into the episode and is further pointed out by Wakaba as being someone she knows from elementary school, 
further identifying him as the Onion Prince. That being said, it's not all smiles and good memories from Wakaba on the part of Tatsuya, as he says that he transferred away without her knowledge in the background of this pretty comical title of the Onion Prince coming from an incident when they were younger where Wakaba got teased for her hair looking similar to an onion and declaring Tatsuya to be her Onion Prince to protect her. Much to his confusion. And when it's revealed that he's returned and is instantly wanting to try and get close to Usuna, despite Usuna rebuffing his letter and attempts to at getting close to her, does he attempt to try and use Wakaba to get close to him? We start to see a side of her which we haven't seen yet. Her own inner turmoil is starting to come to the surface. See, Wakaba at this point has more or less played second fiddle to essentially everyone around Utena, from the student council to Anfi to even people like Mitsuru in terms of being someone important in the overarching story. So from both a meta-contextual look at this as well as a view into Wakaba as a person in the ward of Atori, it shows us a different dimension to her other than being the hyperactive comedy sidekick to Utena and one for whom has her own desires for a prince akin to her friend. Something of which that doesn't go unnoticed by Wakaba, despite her attempts to reflect back on the situation. But as it turns out, it's more likely that Wakaba's desires are more mutual than she thinks, as Tatsuya feels the same way towards her, and simply wants to be with Utena to get to Wakaba. Once again, the shoujo aspect of the series is coming out with this part of the story for sure, as the situation involving Wakaba and Tatsuya ends up becoming a comedy of miscommunicated errors, as Tatsuya suddenly finds out he wasn't the prince that she was referring to, and rather it was someone else. And while you may expect his walk to the Makage seminar to set him up for being the next Black Rose duelist, not even Soji is willing to set this guy up for being the next duelist ever after having his heart broken up like that, even calling him a, a good person and saying that his heart is pure. Even that or Soji can't stand him because he's too relatable to him. You make the call. No, instead the turn that this part of the saga takes is one that keeps the focus squarely on Wakaba. And she's seen going back to her dorm and the person waiting for her is none other than the exiled student council member himself, Sayerji. Yes, impossibly one of the best moves the series has ever pulled off in the long run. They followed up on the story beat which kicked off the entire chain of events that started the series off to begin with in Wakaba's yearning for Sayerji. Despite what a terrible person he is, mind you. And this is followed up on in detail by the following episode, Wakaba Flourishing, in which we not only see what the deal is with Sayerji being in Wakaba's room to begin with, but also Wakaba's own feelings towards him still being apparent, as it's been said that she's keeping Sayonji for a while, and now feels like he's outstay as welcome to a degree. However, Wakaba basically demands that he stays, even revealing to him her own feelings for him in a sense and keeping him a secret to everyone. But to her credit, it does seem to be making her happy and less aloof in day-to-day -day life, save for declining to hang around with the people around her such as Uta to spend time with Sayonji instead. But that's perfectly normal, right? So long as Wakaba is happy and everything, it's gotta mean it's a good thing for everyone involved, right? Heck, he's even giving her something nice and whatnot. He's gotta be changed, it makes it so much better for her. Well, all it takes is for Sayonji to ask Wakavi about how Envy is doing for her to understand that, like Akira mentions in this episode, Wakaba isn't Sayonji's special one. It still is, and always has been, Envy Hamemia, the Rose Bride he's so obsessed with. So you can imagine that Wakava takes us about as well as you could expect her to. Yep, in one of the best twists of this arc, Wakaba is the next Black Rose duelist, born out of jealousy and further manipulated as such by Sayonji, as he uses the hairpin made by Sayonji to push her into the seminar by planting it on Anthe in exchange for getting Sayonji back into the school. But as he's about to take his leave, Wakaba comes in and takes the sword from his chest, and seals her fate as the next duelist for Utena. The dueling arena tables are adorned with the same pins that Sayonji made, colored to represent each named character in the show. Bar Wakaba. The shock on Uta's face says it all from the get-go. This isn't just another duel for her and her guard is immediately off from the beginning. Anfi having to literally beg Utena from the girl to take the sword from her, despite Utena's continued protests of being unwilling to use it against Wakaba. And she doesn't. This duel effectively is Wakaba directly going for Anfi at every term, determined to kill her both for Soji's gain and for her own revenge for stealing Sayoji from her. This being Utena's confirmation that the prince she was referred to all along was always Sayonji, 
a realization that comes too late for her to do anything rational about it. Wakama is brutal in this battle. Not only has she taken Sayoji's sword, but she's taken his ruthlessness on board as well, pulling out Uta's hair during the battle to berate her, not relenting when Uta doesn't pull the sword from Anvi, all the while proclaiming her own worst feelings onto Uta. Declaring Usana looks down on her, someone who she considers a friend and thinks her no better than the student council who look down on them all. But even despite the disadvantage, Usana continues to try and talk sense and reason into Wakaba, even directly assuring her that despite everything she's said and done, she's still a close and important friend to her, even as she takes Sayonji's sword and strikes Wakaba's rose, ending the duel as a single tear comes down from Wakaba's eye. Uzuna refusing to let go of her friend, even in the end of it all. And while the ending bit of Sayonji returning to the school like nothing happened, and Wakaba returning to an empty dorm room once more might seem like a depressing way to end this, I'm afraid it's a lot worse in the long term than you think. Aside from one moment at the end of the saga that shows them on slightly better terms, but still very tense nonetheless, her and Uzuna spend less and less time as the series goes on, implying that Wakaba didn't just forget about what happened with her being a Black Rose duelist like the ones before her, and remembering the words she said to Utena, and Utena as well unfortunately remembering them in such a way that they now have a very noticeable fracture in their relationship. And of the rest of the series, outcome is led to be believed, this rift doesn't get patched up at any point before the ending of the series, with the echoing emptiness of Wakaba's living space symbolizing not just Sayonji's absence, but also her own feeling of feeling truly alone following along from what she did to Utena. It's the most depressing point of the series of Utena up until this point, but what I would argue is the peak of the Black Rose Saga, and probably my favorite duel of the series, not just at this point, but in general. Capping off this part of the saga, however, is the episode Vermin, and as you may have caught on to the theme of the duels happening this season by now, you may come to wonder why Nanami is once again at the focal point of one of these, except it isn't really her at the focus, and rather her support group that's constantly around her, particularly Keiko, the one with twin tails, not like they mention her name much. However, while Keiko is the one to focus on character-wise, it also once again brings us around to the topic of Toga Kiryu finally coming back into the spotlight, especially given he is now able to stand after seven odd episodes of being slumped in a chair by himself. But it works well with the two stories intersecting with this episode's plot. See, Keiko has been one of Nanami's most loyal love. Well, I wouldn't say she's a friend, more like a higher class servant than Misuru. And she, plus the rest of her trio, end up devoting themselves to her so much that it feels like their entire lives are spent to her en entirely. Which eventually does come around in a bad way when Nanami has her not only prepare a party for Toga to feel better, but is then told that she needs to take care of some paperwork for Nanami on the night of it. And, as it turns out, Keiko has a bit of a crush on Toga, yearning for him to notice her and mirror her own love for him in return. Yet, as we see from the likes of Nanami chastising Uzuna in the episode, it seems like she may have some hurdles to go through in order to obtain said love through Nanami. This comes to a head in the second act of the episode, as Keiko sees Toga out in the rain by himself. Seeing this as her chance to finally be able to be near him in his lucidish state of being that he's been in this entire saga, seemingly taking advantage of this to fulfill her deepest desires, much to Nanami's frustration. And with the Black Rose being picked up, you'd assume Nanami would be the one to behold it. But in another good twist of this part of the saga, Nanami ends up taking away all the privileges being associated to her as given Keiko, and outright tells her that trying to get near her brother is an unforgivable sin, and tells her she's the same kind of vermin that Utena was earlier. It stings a bit more for Keiko when the ones she called her friends, the ones that have been beside her since the beginning, ignore her entirely due to their status of Nanami not changing, effectively ostracizing Keiko from her social status, and of course, you know the jewel, she enters in the elevator, gives into her darkness like those before her, and then, with one caress of Toga's chest, she takes his sword, and the final Black Rose duelist has taken its place. The deaths of the arena have been covered in the umbrellas that Keiko gave to Toga previously, representing her only attempt at being able to get close to the person she loves so dearly, and it being taken from her. Funnily enough, as well, this is the first duel in the saga that actively acknowledges the fact that each sword is being pulled is similar to the Struan Council members. 
Just something I got to point out here real quick. The song played here, transparent period of adolescence, backdrops Keiko's feelings of her dream of being with Toga being taken from her, as well as her realization that Nanami is truly the one to be despised around her through this arc's actions. Her fight, however, isn't exactly the best. Like Kanaya before her, this duel isn't really given much time to showcase her as a duelist, as she's being in just over 60 seconds from bell to bell. That plus the ending comments by Ujina saying how she didn't even know her name, assuming she was just Nanami's devoted friend, and the moments of her commentating on the roots of hatred spreading to where nobody can see them just one episode after dueling Wakaba, it's so much harder in this climax. Tying the three episodes we've seen together in a way like this just sits different on we rewatches in my opinion. Unfortunately, Keiko goes back to the way she was previously. Unlike Wakaba, she isn't able to remember her inner pain and desires, reverting back to her prior persona, almost as if this entire episode never happened and the power imbalance between Keiko and Nanami is back to how it was before. However, much like how Anfi states that she's simply lying to herself however long it takes in order to stay beside Nanami, it does raise a bit more of a point for the remainder of this arc, as it seems like it's more than Keiko that has been lying throughout this. Episode 22, Nemuru Memorial Hall, begins the two-part finale that caps off the Black Rose Saga, with us beginning with the familiar sight of Dios and Akio talking to one another, mentioning the last of the Black Roses in passing to Soji, showing that despite being the mastermind behind the duelist, he himself bears a traditional Rose Crest seal, as opposed to the Black Rose rings he's given out all throughout this saga and the bigger mysteries surrounding Soji end up being the focal point of this episode, as not only are the episodes in the main cast trying to figure out more about who he is and what his motivations are, with the Shrewd Castle trying to find out the most given the whole big victims of each duelist for this entire arc. The episode itself, however, focuses on the history of Soji Bakage and his past, as he tells the majority of it to Uchida as she's around the Nemuro Memorial Hall, Telling the history of the eponymous Nemuro Hall and its Professor Nemuro, who was lost as a result of a fire that took place years ago. However, the flashbacks shows us the Professor Nemuro in question, showing us that the Professor and Soji Makage are one and the same, and that the Rosecrest Seals haven't just been a recent thing for end of the world schemes, but have been in action for quite some time. Not only that, but with the constant mentions of those same boys wearing the Rose Crest seals talking about gaining eternity as a result of their experiments with a certain entity, it's obvious to put the two together that this is all connected to one end of the world, similar to that of the student council that we are dealing with now. It's also when we are introduced to one Mamiya that has been with Soji this entire time, showing that he is a sickly boy from the same period of time, and that Nemuro had basically been working on a project alongside Mamiya's sister, who had joined it in order to try and save Mamiya from his illness, despite being told that said project won't cure it. Mamiya, on the other hand, has some opinions on the results being used towards him used to try and last eternally, as they put it. Not exactly resenting the idea of eternity, but it's not just that that seems to make connections to what we've experienced already, as a red-shirted man with dark skin hands never a letter, and offers him the first steps to revolutionize the world. Yep, if you put it all together by now, the person that they are working for and what is meant to be implied to be end of the world is Akio Atori, and it proves that he has done this dance with the Rosecrest Seals beforehand, and what he's doing now is just a continuation of his efforts. To whatever end they are serving is beyond the viewer's comprehension fully yet, however, as we shift focus to what has been building up. The burning down of Nemuro Memorial Hall is shown, Mamiya having been the culprit behind burning down the hall 100 years ago, and Nemuro justifying it as having the path of eternity open up in time before we jump forward to present day. However, there is one piece of information that comes across as interesting to the viewer, as there is a mention of Mamiya's sister visiting his grave in modern day, commentating about how both Soji and Akio haven't aged since then. Not only is it implying that Mamiya, Soji's Rose Bride, is already dead, but that he and Akio are ageless, as in potentially already finding eternity. This all comes to a head in the finale of the Black Rose Saga, episode 23, The Terms of a Duelist. The final Black Rose has been sprouted and plucked and by what would be assumed by Mamiya. However, thanks to the last episode's realizations at the last second, it's clear whomever this person is, it isn't the same Mamiya from a hundred years ago that knew Saoji as Professor Nemuro. 
And an interesting development arises in the opening parts of this episode as both Soji and the student council are debating on having Ujina join either side, with the council making the strongest argument of all of having a good reason to keep Ujina close to ensure Anthe, the Rose Bride, is kept safe, especially from those who wish to have her be harmed. However, Soji makes the first move on to Ujina, while she searches for Anvi, who's apparently gone missing during this entire period, and Soji tries to make his mark on Ujina by asking if she has anyone close to her that has any problems, with her instantly flashing back to the truth of her prince story from years ago, implying she may be about to be roped in by a Makage. However, upon finally going into the Makage seminar herself for the first time at the saga, she's shown the images of all the Black Rose duelists she's faced off hanging on the wall outside of Makage's office, the horror coming across her face as she realizes who Makage truly is, the person who established the Black Rose duelists, and, most importantly, the person who began the duel game at Atori Academy to begin with, despite his own lack of care surrounding the beginning of the duels at the start of it 100 years ago. However, as we also find out, he doesn't see Ujina as herself, as he sees the person he loved long ago, Tokiko, Mabia's sister, and is trying to get her in order to try and attain a love he had lost long ago. Ujina takes his attempts to coerce her and to try and make his... Well, what you would expect by now. This arguably makes Ujina the most pissed off she's been in the entire series until now. Having had her fill of people manipulating her and those around her, she challenges him to a duel, the first time arguably she's done so the entire series. Mikage takes it very harshly, collapsing in his own elevator, sinking to the lowest depths, and taking the final black rose as his own. Unlike any of the other duels, there's no Zum montage to prelude it. We smash cut to the dueling arena, with the pictures of Mali and Takiko together on each of the desks, representing the two things Soji was the most after 100 years, with Utena and Soji staring each other down with an icy glare that could freeze anyone solid. I Am An Imaginary Living Body soundtracks this duel, its mentions of puppets and the like being a clear allegory to the true tragedy of Makage. That being, he was never truly a big player in the overall story of the Rosebride duels. Rather, he was a pawn of someone else's grand machinations. Throughout this entire duel, however, Makage is trying desperately to show that Utena that he and her are just the same, with Utena refuting his claims at every single mention. But to be honest, while it was something we will get to more next time, it is worth saying that for what it's worth, Makage isn't fully wrong. Regardless, however, Ujina beats him like every other duelist before her, but, what, but it's what comes at the climax of the duel and immediately after is the most important part of this. See, the pictures that have been showing on the tables of the dueling arena, they now show a different boy altogether from the person that's been guiding him, like he had been hallucinating the Mamiya he knows the entire time. The visions of Mamiya telling him that, that Tokiko and him exist in his memories only, and were then shown the truth of the event 100 years ago that it was actually Soji who lit the fire that caused Nimero Hall to burn down, the subsequent breakdown of the lie he had been told causing him to falter, and Utena slashes Rose. Smash cut to Akio's observatory. A phone rings. Akio picking up to reveal it to be Soji, now going by Nemuro, with Akio confirming that Mami had died 100 years ago, and that this whole event was caused by the lingering regret he felt over the entire affair a century ago. Mami being shown alongside Akio, but Forth's being swapped in for Amphi in his place, the Nemero Hall now becoming the dilapidated, burnt building we see in its final moments, with Mickey commentating how he can't remember what it's called, implying the entirety of Nemero Hall to either be an illusion brought about by Mikage, or some bigger force at play. One thing is for certain, however, with all the pieces tying it together from the past being brought about by Mikage, as well as the, as well as the questions brought about on if the validity of it was ju what just happened was real, or if it was something much more sinister, it seems as though not everything is as it seems after all at Tori Academy. Especially when it comes to the likes of Aki or Tori and Anthony Hibibia, it's hard to discern what is the truth about their motives, and when it's been a lie spread so far, that it may break even those they love the most. So of course, that's not how the Black Rose Saga ends. Well, it's how the main part of it ends anyway, but you remember how I said that there were only eight episodes dedicated to it and the other two were filler ones? Well, guess what they chose to sandwich in between this part of the series. If you guessed another recap, you'd be close, but also way off. 
It's another Yamaguchi Nanami episode. Because of course it is! In any case, the secret Nanami diary technically caps off the Black Rose Saga as a showcase for Mitsuru Log Nanami again. A standard fare, sure, but you get the horse coming in suddenly about to travel Nanami and Mitsuru saving her. Then, after winding up in the hospital, it's revealed he's kept a diary of 24 attempts to try and win her heart. And the reveal on this is that Mitsuru has been skulking around in the background around Nanami since her first appearance in episode 3, taking notes about her the entire time and ensuring that he is able to employ some tactics to be able to win her over. You can take a wild guess as to what happens here. Yes, it's revealed that Mitsuru has been around since her first introduction has been doing many things to try and find out how to win her. But they're all mostly from Yamaguchi episodes such as Curried High Trip, Take Care, and Cowbell of Happiness. But they also show off bits from the first half of Sunlit Garden as well. The crux of this is that he was behind the misfortune that's befell Nanami in the past, such as the paranoia and Take Care and turning into a cow and Cowbell of Happiness. As it turns out, he had several different strategies to be able to be with Nanami forever. And the climax coming from him being stripped naked, Nanami passing out, and catching his book of reading all the details for her Self. Thus ending the. Thus ending. Thus ending. No. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. This isn't how this part of the retrospective is going to end, goddammit. There has to be something better that I could try and work to end this on a better note. Anything. Oh. All right. I can work with this. So before we got the version of Utena that we all know today through Central Park Media back in the tail end of the 90s, there was another attempt done by a group known as Inoki Films to bring revolutionary girl Utena over to the West, albeit in a different way than what we have now. This version, titled Ursula's Kiss, was in a similar vein to the likes of Nelvana's Car Captors and Dick's Sailor Moon adaptions, with most of the main cast having their names even completely westernized to fit the time frame of which it came out, and seemingly having a lot of, of the original concept downplayed, or completely changed to fit a general audience. However, information of this version of Utena has been sparse for decades, not even any confirmation that this even existed to begin with, or if it was just some elaborate prank done by the Utena community at large. And then in August 2022, a discovery from the Library of Congress discovered that visual media for Ursula's Kiss did in fact exist, and with the rise of people magic to find certain bits and bobs of media such as the original Saban Moon pilot that was seemingly lost to time by the likes of Ray Murda, I got inspired to myself to do some digging around to see what I could find on Ursula's Kiss. Timeline of searching, 3rd of January 2023. Rotary.nu has an archived website of Ursula's Kiss from Anoki Films USA. Find out Anoki Films USA went defunct in 2010. Cry a little. 7th of January 2023. Deep dive into Anoki Films. Find their website is still up and under their index it shows another webpage. Dissimilar from the one on Rotary.nu and find a contact link on the website. Proceed to ask if anybody working currently for Anoki Films knows of any information about Ursula's Kiss or knew anyone who worked on it previously. Waiting begins. 25th of January 2023. No response in over two weeks. Send a tweet out in the hopes of getting some help in the matter and finding connections. 3rd of February 2023. Proceed to ask R. Utena about this. Get some links back to the empty movement. But one person comments a Twitter thread from one of the people who worked on the localization for Utena for Central Park Media, confirming that a dub for what would be Ursula's Kiss never even made it to production. More of a proof of concept stage. So, confirmation was done. Ursula's Kiss only existed as a proof of concept for Anoki Films, with, while Central Park Media took over actually licensing it and producing the dub. The Library of Congress confirmation of there being visual material was even later confirmed to just be a cover of Volume 2 of the VHS as done by Central Park Media, as software sculptors, the people who were listed on the Library of Congress, were a subdivision of Central Park Media at one point. Granted they were a separate entity before being merged with Central Park Media, 
But it's unclear if the version Inoki Films made was the one Software Sculptures was working on prior to being bought by Central Park Media. But with that being said, one has to assume what would have happened in another lifetime if we did end up getting that dub in the end. I mean, out of all the possible timelines in which Ujina came out, you'd think there'd be one where this came to light, right? Hold that thought. Once, long ago, a little girl lost her parents. Left in the world all on her own, she grew very sad. That was until one day, a prince rode on a white horse and gave her a rose-crested ring, promising to return one day if she kept a noble heart and was strong. Years passed, however, and the girl grew tired of waiting, declaring that she would become a prince herself. Now, the girl who would become a prince has begun a new journey, entering the halls of Ottery Junior High School, where a mysterious game is being played by the Seekers of Armageddon. Who are they? And why have they called the girl to this school? The answer lies in the Castle of Eternity. My name is Ursula Thompson. I'm a 14-year-old student at Atori Junior High. I'm new to this school, however, you couldn't tell, given how everyone else at the school seems to look at me. First day I came in here, I was told off by this old crone of a teacher for not dressing correctly, all because I wear a boy's outfit. What's wrong with that? Oh, and speaking of the boys, they all don't like me as much either. Just because I outdo them at sports, they all call me things like tomboy. Not my fault they're not as good as me. The girls they all like don't seem to mind me, though. They do get a bit much for my taste sometimes. All of them except- Incoming! Hey, Ursula! How are you doing today, huh? That's Wanda. She's been my best friend since forever. Although, I do think she takes the whole inseparable friendship thing a bit too far sometimes. She has this major crush on this one guy at school, some green hair guy named Simon. Although, he mainly hangs around with the student council, and has his own obsession with this mysterious girl who's always in the garden at break times. Angie, I think her name is. <gasps> Simon, how could you? Shoving the Rose Bride like that out of anger is quite unbecoming of a member of the student council. You seriously can't be thinking anything good about a guy who pushes girls around like that, can you, Wanda? Oh, come on, Ursula. He's obviously just going through some things personally. He's just a misunderstood soul. You all seem to have a problem with what I did earlier today. Huh? 
you treating the Rose Bride like that in public disgraces the public image of the Council in the eyes of the school. You know what the Seekers of Armageddon will do to us if you continue to treat her like this. It's an embarrassment. Honestly, you are pulling all of our reputation down with you, all because you can't be an adult. If any of you have issues with the way I treat dear Angie, you can duel me for her. Otherwise, I don't care what those Seekers of Armageddon think about me treating her. She's just fine, aren't you, Angie? Yes, Mr. Simon. See? She's just fine. Nothing for any of you to worry about. I think someone needs to take him down a peg! Then again, the Seekers are saying there is a new duelist after all. you do something so cruel like that, Simon? What are you talking about? I haven't done anything that bad. Don't lie to me. You put that letter Wanda poured her heart out into, out for everyone to mock her for. Oh, that was from her? I thought it was just some generic love letter from another secret admirer. If she really wanted it to stand out, she should have put more effort into it. <laughs> How dare you say that about her, you bully! You probably treat Angie just as poorly. I want to fight you! You're the new duelist that the Seekers told us all about. <laughs> Very well. Meet me at the dueling grounds outside the school before curfew. I'll put you in your place like all the others. Well, I guess nowhere to go but up, then. So I see the tomboy finally made it up here after all. Teachers always said you were never punctual a day in your life. You're lucky I could find my way up here with how mysterious this all is, Simon. Ah, so you do possess the proof of a duelist after all. Nobody can get up here without one of these rings. To think they give one to such common folk like you, however. How can you stand to be with him, Angie? Should your rose be struck, you will lose the duel. Those are the terms of the duelist set by the Seekers. The Seekers? Who are you talking about? You've said far too much, Angie! You should keep yourself silent unless spoken to. It's the job of the Rose Bride. You monster, Simon! How could anyone ever want to be with you? <laughs> Enough stalling. Angie! The sword at once! Power of the Seekers that sleep within, come forth and grant my master your strength. Bring me the power of Armageddon! Girl, I expected much less out of you. But then again, 
A tomboy such as you doesn't know what that means. If it means I can kick your butt, then it's fine by me! <laughs> you really think you can beat me? You can barely even stand against my strength. Much less with half a toy sword like yours. What kind of game are you playing at, you sicko? Game? This isn't a game. This duel is set by the Seekers over the Rose Bride. Whomever wins gains her and her power. I don't know who these Seekers are. But one thing I know for certain is I'm taking you down. For Wanda! Angie, what? What just happened? Don't worry, Simon. We can still be friends. <gasps> Quite an interesting development indeed. This Ursula seems to have more mystery about her than we thought. I might need to keep an eye on her myself. The Seekers will want to hear about this. What a day! I could sleep like a rock after an exercise like that. If you remember, you are now my master, Miss Ursula. Shall we go home? It is past curfew now. Don't want to get into more trouble, do we? Sure. Of course we don't. You know what? I, I think we were good in our universe. Alright, so I guess one way we can end this part off, honestly, is by talking about something I feel like ha I haven't really delved into all that much by this point, despite having talked it up as much in the beginning. Ushina being a deconstruction of the shoujo anime and magical girls. And while one could potentially argue its status to the matter of being a deconstruction of such, given that it plays into such tropes in the matter so well, it's hard to argue it being such in an age where the likes of Aiden Gellion were the king of the anime scene for better or for worse, and that Ushina's deconstruction of the genre around it is much a sign of the times as Ava was. Because yes, up until this point, one could make an argument that RGU has basically been a typical shoujo in most of his aspects up until now. There's a point of contention that, m that a lot would consider the aspects we've covered a lot beneath the surface that one would think upon upon first glance. It's why I say when coming into this video and the next that you familiarize yourself with this series and don't treat watching this as a replacement for watching the series itself. I've already glossed over 24 episodes of the show by now, and in those glances, I haven't even said everything that can be said about each part of every minute detail of this series because there's a lot more going on here than you may think. You know the phrase about comparing something to an onion, and how it has many different layers to it, and the more you peel back at it, the more you end up finding? Well, if there's anything I've learned about Utena from re-watching it in private and reviewing it for this retrospective, it's the more that I peel back at this series' layers, there seems to be an endless amount of them waiting for me. That being said, if you've made it this far, Let's talk a bit about why some people consider RGU a deconstruction of shoujo and magical girls and what some of the best examples of it are. <laughs> 
First part to talk about is what of the ideals and magical girl animes of each protagonist having an alternate persona to them. Usagi and the gang to the Sailor Scouts, Cutie Honey's old getup, and even Sakura Kinamoto's persona as the cod capture could be argued as primary examples of this. Meanwhile, Utena, despite having her own transformation sequence, barely changes at all from her appearance at school to her duelist outfit, only having some tassels and shoulder pads added when she enters the arena. She isn't entering as a different persona as the revolutionary girl. She's just Utena Tenjo from the beginning to the end of the series. Not only that, but the people she keeps on fighting for are just evil villains of the week who have bland agendas behind them. Each, including those in the Black Rose saga we just went through, all have their own agendas and things that they are all fighting for. Either to aid them in their want to envy as the Rose Bride, or to kill her in order to gain their own sense of happiness. And even beyond that, the mysterious organization types or evil groups in general that you would normally find in a show like this? Not exactly a thing with End of the World, as, spoiler alert I guess for those who can't read between the lines so far, is just revealed to be one man in the form of Akio Watori. And while his ambitions right now may be unclear, we're going to find out next time that his desires and motivations behind his actions not just in the past, but even in the present are a lot more sinister than you may think for a charming man such as him. Hell, speaking of charming man archetypes, Toga Kiryu. One would expect him to be something akin to your Mabaru from Sailor Moon to Utena Usagi, but he ends up being more like Jadeite by the end of his initial run, a cunning man who plays the role of prince to try and court the heart of his opponent and cut her down at her lowest point. And once he fails, he falls into such a deep pit that he can barely take care of himself in order to try and survive, all because he lost a duel to the person who he undermined so much and made her feel so similar. It's quite a twist of fate for a character such as him. Which leads us to the relationship between Utena and Amphi, something which you can pick up from my talks of how they were in the beginning is one that Utena isn't one of those protagonists that just up and accepts that this is a thing so quickly like many before her, and even after her have done. She never asked to be Amphi's gateway from Sionji. She merely acted as good of heart because she saw a friend of hers get hurt to start the chain reaction off. And the very first chance she gets, she tries to fight it out of this whole affair, only entertaining continuing to be the duelist for the Rose Bride out of a sense of obligation for Anfi. Something of which has turned into a genuine sense of protection by Anfi by this point in the story, and maybe a little bit more. Again, something we'll touch upon in detail next time as it blossoms forth in more ways than one. But all in all, Utena's status as a deconstruction of shoujo and magical girls is not one to be scoffed at or undersold at any point. In fact, even today, I'd argue it being one of the best parts of why people should watch Utena in the same way that people should watch Evangelion or Madoka Magica. Because you could easily be told that these series are important based upon their references or what they did for everything after the fact in their genre, but it's by watching it and experiencing it yourself do you truly understand why it's an important piece of media that deconstructs what it sets itself in and why just hearing about it from others just isn't enough. But with that being said, I think this is a good point as any to leave on for when we next meet. The road ahead is long and dark, my dear viewers, but this road will lead us to the end of the world.